So welcome back to the final video in Higher Biology Unit 2 Metabolism and Survival. So we're looking at the genetic control of metabolism. In terms of selecting and isolating microbes, wild strains of microbes are selected and cultured and pure strains are then isolated and screened for desirable traits. We can improve those strains once they're selected. Uh, the imp it may lack important traits it may lack the genetic stability that we'll need in industrial microbes, ability to grow on low cost nutrients, ability to overproduce the target compound, and it might not allow us to easily harvest the target compound. But strain improvement can occur by two methods mutagenesis, firstly, and secondly, recombinant DNA technology. So we look at both of these in turn. Mutations and mutagenesis, first of all. A mutation Mutations are heritable changes in an organism's DNA and they cause genetic diversity. They're useful, usually harmful but some can be beneficial. Mutagenesis itself is the creation of mutations. A mutation rate can increase by various mutagenic agents such as UV, radiation and chemicals. Improved strains may be created and industrial microbes undergo stages of mutagenesis and screening. An improved strain uh, often lacks inhibitory control mechanisms so that in our industrial processes that, that we require this microbe for, it can produce vast quantities of the desired product. However, sometimes these strains uh, can undergo a reverse mutation and revert back to the wild type state, so they need to be monitored on a regular basis. If we look at something called site-specific mutagenesis, mutations often occur randomly in the genome and geneticists study mutations in specific genes and this is possible due to use of PCR and these mutated genes we can insert them back into the cells and observe the changes in the phenotype so for example a DNA strand can be copied multiple times by PCR and the mutations are different genes uh, the effects of which are observed when they're placed back into the cells if we look now at recombinant DNA technology this is basically genetic engineering the transfer of genetic material from one organism to another can occur within the same species or between different species and when an organism is created by recombinant DNA technology we say it's been artificially transformed it can be used to improve existing strains can amplify metabolic steps remove uh, inhibitors within the cell's metabolism and increase the yield of the desired product they are trying to make at the time. And many cells uh, often break down the products they make, but such cells that have been, been improved in this way will secrete the product into the surrounding medium in which they're growing so they can be so it can be harvested easily. And genes are introduced to make sure that these microbes cannot survive if they were to get out into the environment. So we're looking now more closely at an artificial transformation of a bacterium by recombinant DNA technology. So essentially it involves taking a desirable gene and splicing it into the DNA of a vector, in this case a bacterial plasmid, and popping it back into a host cell. And that host cell will then contain recombinant DNA, own DNA plus the DNA from another source. There are certain enzymes involved in this process, restriction and the nucleases, of course, that we have come across before, these cut DNA at specific uh, short nucleotide sequence sites, like so. So that's where the restriction endonuclease would target, and it would produce what's called sticky ends. DNA ligase would seal the sticky ends of the required gene and the plasmid together to create that recombinant plasmid, which is then placed back into a bacterial host cell. So for example if we look at that process there's the DNA from an organism containing the required gene and uh, a stretch of the DNA from a plasmid. The endonucleases cut out the required gene and there's the sticky ends and those same endonucleases are used to open up the plasmid and then the required gene slots into the plasmid using complementary sticky ends and ligase stitches the DNA together. So that plasmid can now be popped back into a host bacterial cell.
So the, the entire process essentially, you begin with DNA from an organ organism containing the required gene. All those different colors represent different genes. And you have a bacterium that's ho already had uh, a plasmid containing resistance to ampicillin uh, within it. So all those uh, genes are cut from the, uh, from the donor organism. There's the required one. There's all the other fragments, or other genes, coding for other proteins. So plasmids are removed and opened up with uh, endonuclease, of course, like so. And then all those plasmids uh, take up uh, the various DNA fragments, and they're inserted with ligase. But of course, some of those plasmids will contain uh, the genes that you do not wish for. Those plasmids are then grown in a growth medium containing the antibiotic and only those that have taken up the plasmid and so have ampicillin resistance will be able to grow. So that eliminates those and further screening will get rid of the ones that have taken up the wrong gene like so. And so DNA samples extracted from cells of the surviving colonies are screened for the presence of the required gene. And once you have uh, the correct gene in the plasmid uh, within the bacterium, uh, you then can cultivate uh, that particular bacterium. The vector itself is a plasmid, a recombinant plasmid in this case. It carries the DNA from one organism and brings about transformation of another. And the vector, the plasmid, needs to have the following features. It will have a marker gene, which provides it with resistance to ampicillin, uh, an origin of replication, because plasmids can be replicated independently within a bacterial cell, and the restriction site, where the endonuclease uh, opens up the plasmid for the gene to be inserted, like so. And there's a basic description of what I've just said. Moving on to artificial chromosomes now. Uh, these are uh, a modern feature. Uh, they're essentially vectors, but they can carry much longer DNA sequences uh, compared to plasmids. They will have the following features. There are centromeres, origins of replication, of course, where replication begins. Uh, genes and telomeres at the ends, just like ordinary chromosomes. And uh, there's an, an ordinary chromosome on the left, but uh, a human artificial chromosome, much smaller. But essentially, its origins of replication were the, the genes, the required genes, uh, can be inserted later on. So a human artificial chromosome could carry uh, multiple genes uh, to manufacture multiple substances. Limitations of prokaryotes uh, compared to eukaryotes uh, in uh, recombinant DNA technology. Eukaryotes, of course, contain introns and exons. Uh, the introns are excised by splicing. Uh, recombinant yeast cells, as an example, you may prefer to use them for the pro production of plant and animal proteins, uh, despite uh, yeast cells being a bit more fussy and having more demanding culture conditions. Prokaryotes, on the other hand, uh, they don't have any introns, of course, and often, as a result of this, you get incorrectly folded or inactive proteins being produced. And some bacteria uh, may break down uh, the product that you're trying to harvest and not secrete it um, into the surrounding medium. So any kind of microbe uh, or microbial product that you're using or producing, it must be safe to use. It must do the job it's supposed to. It must be fit for purpose, pure and uncontaminated, and pose no threat. Now, the manufacturing process itself should maintain very specific standards of purity of product and uses well-designed and safe facilities. Okay, that's the end of all these videos for Unit 2 Biology. Thank you very much indeed.